For this video, I'm going to look at a pretty standard physics problem, and instead of asking you to solve for any particular quantity, I'm going to show you how to characterize the system completely so that you can solve for any quantity that you're asked for. So in this particular variation of the problem, we have a ladder leaning against a wall, and there are any number of variations of this problem. Some of them will tell you that you're leaning against a frictionless wall. Some of them, uh, instead of having the ladder on the floor, will have it as a bar um, attached to a support or a pivot. Uh, so you'll see variations of this a lot, but the way you proceed is basically the same for all of it. So we'll just run through this and see if we can get an idea of how to, how to solve this system. So what I've drawn is a picture of the system. And here's my ladder leaning against a wall. It's got a mass of m, it's got a length l, and it makes an angle theta. In this case, theta is given with respect to the floor. Sometimes it'll be given with respect to the wall, but in this case, we've got it with respect to the floor. Uh, then I drew a free body diagram. So I have uh, a normal force from each of the points of contact, right? Every time you touch a surface, you get a normal force acting back on your object. So here, and that normal force will be normal to that surface, right? Perpendicular to the surface. So I have first normal force from the floor here. I have the second normal force from the wall here. And I have the gravitational force. I put it acting in the middle of the ladder. Unless I'm told otherwise, I'm going to assume that uh, this thing is uniform, the mass is distributed uniformly, which means the center of gravity or the center of mass is at the geometrical center, so that's where I'm going to apply the force of gravity. Notice if my ladder has a distance of L, this, has, this will be applied at a point L over 2 away from this end and L over 2 away from this end. Uh, in addition, I've included two frictional forces, right, there's a static friction 1, a static friction 2, the idea is that this ladder is not sliding. As I said, sometimes the wall will be frictionless, so you won't have a static friction force there. Sometimes it will be. I just included it so that we can see how to completely characterize this system. And next to it, I've included my equilibrium conditions. If this thing is in equilibrium, it has to satisfy all three of these. Some of the forces in the x-direction is equal to zero. Some of the forces in the y-direction is equal to zero. And the new one, the sum of the torques, has to be equal to zero. Now that's the sum of the torques about any point. When we deal with rotating systems, uh, very often, not always, but very often, the most logical place about which to sum the torques is the center of rotation. In this case, it's not rotating, so there is no center of rotation. So uh, the sum of the torques about any point in space has to be zero. So the upshot of that is I'm going to pick a point which makes my job easy. And hopefully we'll see uh, in just a second where that is. So down here, I've labeled these equations 1, 2, and 3. Down here, I've unpacked equations 1, 2, and 3. That is, I've given you the summation of the forces. In the uh, x direction, I've got the static friction force 1 and the normal force. Let me move this down so you can still see the free body diagram. Right, in the x-direction, I've got this static friction force and this normal force. The, that has to equal zero, uh, or the summation of those two has to equal zero. In the y-direction, I've got the normal force here. I've got static friction force here. I've got mg here. And let me just say a word about directions. Right, In the x-direction, it's very obvious that if this is in equilibrium, the static frictional force has to be moving to the right, or has to be directed to the right. I've only got one other force in that direction, which is the normal force. It's directed to the left. If I'm going to be in equilibrium, the friction force has to go to the right. In the y direction, that's not the case. I'm not actually sure which direction this static friction force goes. I'm pretty sure it's up, but there are some conditions which I could apply, some other forces which I could bring into play in which that st uh, friction force would be down. Uh, if you don't know the direction, that's okay. Pick one and assign it run through the math, and if you get a negative answer, that will tell you that you oriented it the wrong way. Uh, the number should be the same. Uh, you'll just get a directional shift. So it's not a big deal if you pick wrong. Uh, it will come out in the wash. Okay, so this is the second equilibrium condition. Some of the forces in the y direction is equal zero. And then below it, I've given you the summation of the torques about this point, which I've called P. That is what that P is. 
is this point. I'm summing the torques about that point because N1 and the static friction force 1 both pass through that point. Therefore, they will not provide a torque about that point, right? The, the distance between the point of application of the force and the point about which I'm summing the torques is zero. Therefore, I get zero torque out of it, right? They will not cause a rotation about that point. So that makes two of my forces just go away in my equation. You can see that N1 and FS1 do not appear in this equation. N2 appears, FS2 appears, and the gravitational force appears. But I've lost both of these forces. You could just as easily sum the torques about this point, in which case you will lose N2 and FS2. Right? Uh, you could sum them about this point, in which case you'll lose the gravitational force. You could sum them about any point here. right? You could sum them about this point, but if you do it about this point, then you're going to have contributions to the torque from all of these forces, and that's just going to be a lot of bookkeeping. So uh, be clever, pick a point to sum the torques about, which makes a couple of these forces go away, which is what I've done here. So underneath this, I've unpacked how I got those torques. So I'm basically running through the geometry. So first, let me run through the uh, perpendicular distance method, and then I'll show you uh, the vector resolution method. Right. Uh, for this one, for the first one, uh, L sine theta N2. Uh, so here's N2, the perpendicular distance to the point of rotation. Remember, I can, I can define a distance from this point uh, to the line of action of this force in, in infinite ways. But there's only one line I can draw from this point of, uh, point of summation, not rotation, to that, perp to that line of action which yields a perpendicular arrangement and that is the way I've drawn it here. So that perpendicular distance, if I just look at the geometry, right, if this is theta, this has to be theta, which means this has to be L sine theta. L is my hypotenuse here. So I get that perpendicular distance L sine theta times the force N2. I do the same thing over here for FS2. The line of action I bring down and that perpendicular distance occurs right here. Again, I can, I can, there's a, there's infinite amount of dis distances between this point and this line of action, uh, but there's only one in which this line and that line are perpendicular. Again, from the geometry, this distance is L cosine theta, so the torque then is FS2 times L cosine theta, and both of these, I should point out, produce counterclockwise rotations, so I call them positive. Now let me do the same thing with the gravitational force. It's being applied at this point L over 2 away from this. So my hypotenuse of this triangle is L over 2. Uh, the line of action proceeds very similarly to Fs2. So I get that uh, it's my hypotenuse times the cosine of theta. In this case, that's L over 2 times the cosine of theta. This force, notice, will tend to cause a clockwise rotation. So I call the torque negative. I've got the force times the perpendicular distance, L over 2 cosine theta. Now, if that confuses you, feel free to do this other method. This is the vector resolution method. So instead of finding the perpendicular distance, which tends to be the words that mess everybody up, I'm going to resolve this into components just like I did with an inclined plane, right? It, this looks a little bit different than my forces on the inclined plane, but the procedure is the same, right? So if this is theta, again, that means this is theta. I can resolve this into perpendicular and parallel components that is perpendicular to this ladder, parallel to the ladder. Now the parallel component is not going to cause a torque about this point, just like I can't open a door by pushing on the door towards the hinges, right? There is no torque from this component. That means the whole torque is provided by this component, N2 sine theta, then that is times uh, the moment arm L. So the torque there is L, uh, the moment arm times N2 sine theta. Now let's look at what I got for the torque using the other method. I got N2 times L sine theta, which is the same thing. In this case, the L sine theta came from the geometry. Sorry, the sine theta came from the geometry. In this case, the sine theta comes from the vector resolution. I'm going to do, I'm going to do the same thing with the uh, static frictional force. The geometry is a little harder to see over here. But if you run through it, you'll find that this is theta, which means that the perpendicular component is Fs2 cosine theta. The parallel component is Fs2 sine theta. That's the one that doesn't contribute to the torque. This is the one that contributes to the torque. 
So I get that the moment arm L times the fourth force FS2 cosine theta, just like I got up here, right? Again, that's positive that because that will cause a counterclockwise rotation. If I resolve the gravity, now this looks exactly like an inclined plane problem, so I expect you to be able to do this immediately, right? If I resolve this into components, this is theta. Uh, mg cosine theta then is the perpendicular component. mg sine theta is the parallel component that doesn't contribute. So, and this one, notice, will cause a clockwise rotation, so I'm going to put a negative sign on it. Sorry about this mess here. This is your equal sign. The torque due to this one is minus this moment arm L over 2 times the the component mg cosine theta, uh, and that's where that comes from. Real quickly, let's run over the geometry for this one. If you don't see your way through it, let me flip this over. All right, here's that situation. Here's my uh, my ladder. This is theta. I can draw a little line here, which define this angle as phi. Of course, this is a right triangle, so phi is equal to 90 minus theta. And from the geometry, if this is phi, these two lines are intersecting. That means this has to be phi. But notice, this is a 90 degree angle. So if this is phi, this has to be 90 minus phi, which is theta. Right? So that's the geometry there. I hope this was helpful.